Luckily, this time that was resolved. And we can continue on with the game. We have three more minutes. Who else isn't here? What about Adrian? Come, uh, he's here already. What about uh, the other ones? We have 14 people in the part. Who we are? We have like 14 people participate in the participation. What about Winona? Is Winona here with us, or he? She's. I okay, okay, okay. Parang me medyo ano, medyo, medyo na, pero parang medyo may galit sa akin si Winona. <laughs> Ay, di pa. Oo, oh, oh, sorry naman Winona ha, Winona, sorry, sorry, sorry. Alright, I'll wait, because of that, I'll wait for you Winona. Okay, who else isn't here? And just a chat. There, it's also there written in bold letters in the monitor. Uh, I'm sharing it in the chat as well. In, in the chat as well. Okay. I'll copy and paste it again. Oh. Sino soulmate ko? Who's Deadpool? Sino si Deadpool? Huh? What do you mean? <laughs> si Deadpool. Ah, <laughs> yung ano ko yan, GM. Mga codename yan ng iba kong class. May iba pa kasi akong class aside from you guys. Alam mo naman tayo, kailangan kumita ng ano. Del, please complete your name because this will, be, this will have a prize. Please complete your name, Del, whoever you are. Write your complete names, guys. Charis may, it's okay, because I think that won't fit. The, your whole name won't fit. But at least give me your full name, okay? Full name, guys, full name. Somebody still write, somebody still initial. Alright. Okay. So we'll wait for Del to um, change her name. Alright. Are we ready, everybody? Okay, this will be this will be added. This scores for the, the scores of the top three will be added to the previous scores from before. So hopefully there will be another set of top three this week. Because we want to be as equal. We want to have an equal um, an equal chance for everybody in this class. All right, all right. So that's the end of our um, our timer. Dell is already here. All right, wonderful. Now we can start. Okay, so the title of this game is Bacteria and Chemistry. Such fun. <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned before, which of the following is the test? Which of the following tests requires ninhydrin or ninhydrin solution? It's is it prior? Is it red PYR, blue CAM, bile, uh, yellow DNA, or square pyrolysis? Pyrate hydrolysis. So there's three people who answered correctly. All right. Wonderful, Cesar! Oh my God, you are showing you are showing potential, Cesar. I love it. This is the first time I saw you in the top three. Congratulations, Cesar. Uh, okay, Cesar. Congratulations, Cesar, for seeing your name on the top three today. Hopefully, this will continue until question eleven. All right, a uh, twelve rather. What indicator is used for PYRA test? Phenol red, para amino, para dimethyl amino cinnamaldehyde. L pyrolidunil beta naphthalamide 7.5% sodium hypochlorite. So again, these questions are mainly about chemistry and microbiology. So please try your best to answer these. All right, a lot of the students answered phenol red. Unfortunately, the correct correct answer is dimethyl dime, para amino dimethyl cinnamaldehyde, which again I've told you guys before, cinnamon. PYR, color red ang color. Alright, so again, Noreen Fortunato is in the top, 
Adrian Cummings is here. And remember, guys, please don't forget that the faster you answer the question, the most points you're going to get. All right. Chemical indicator. Chemical used as an indicator for DNA. Test slash meat slash media. Methyl blue, methyl red, methyl orange, methyl green. All right, guys. A lot of the students answered methyl green. Congratulations to, to, to uh, I think everybody is listening. Noreen Fortunato is on fire. Wow. All right, Noreen. All right. Which is the ideal concentration of sodium hypochlorite used as a disinfectant in the clinical lab? 1%, 5%, 10%, 50%. Get this wrong i don't know what i don't know i, I can't say i i have nothing to say blackout daw kala adrian all right so a lot of the okay so that means that people are listening from uh, listening from my lecture yesterday wonderful noreen is still on fire wonderful wonderful okay that girl is on fire all right. What disinfectant is used as a gold standard to compare compare the efficacy of other disinfectants? Phenol red, quaternary ammonium compounds, glutaraldehyde, or formaldehyde. Magbayad ka mo siya sa All right. All right. All right. All right. So we got three seconds. Two, one, zero. All right. Two people answered phenol. Let's see who's those two people. Joanna. All right. Congratulations, Joanna. All right. Which of the following is an end product of hypurate hydrolysis? Benzoic acid, glycerol, both of these, or neither of these? Benzoic acid is the correct answer because it's benzoic acid plus glycerin, not glycerol. So the, the wrong answer is both of these, all right? And neither of these as well because by benzoic acid is there. So by virtue, the correct answer is supposed to be red. So I'm training you guys how to, how to answer in the exams, okay? Because you're going to encounter questions like these. All right, so somebody answered correctly, Anna Athing, all right? I'll interview you later. <laughs> All right, which of the following inhibitor is used in M I M M S A? That is manifold salt agar. All right, is it crystal violet? Is it seven point five percent NaCl? Is it barium fluoride? A barium sulfate, or is it para amino benzoic glycine glycine? All right, so apparently people are listening to me today. Wonderful, because most of them they answered. 7.5 NaCl may renders the growth of halophytic organisms. Wonderful. Noreen is in the top of the class. Wonderful. All right. We have eight more questions, so you don't lose hope. What chemical can be used most likely, most which will be the mic most likely cause of a false positive coagulase test? Is it ethylamine tetraacetic acid, trimethylprimsul, fomethoxazole, citrate, or cefuroxime? What chemical can be most likely can be the most likely cause of false positive coagulase test? So again, people are listening to me. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Okay, so those two are the people who answered correctly. Okay. So rabbit plasma is a reagent used in which of the following tests: catalase, PYR, CAMP, or coagulase test. My goodness, people! If you answer this correctly. You have to keep on watching the videos that we've recorded for you. All right, so wonderful. There's six people who answered correctly, which means the most of the class answered most of the class answered coagulase. Wonderful. All right, so there's no changes in the top three. Let's move on. Which of the following antibiotic is used to differentiate Lanskfeld group C streptococcus? Bacitracin, novobiosin, trimethoprim, sulfomethoxazole, taxo A. Alright, a 
lot of people answered novobiosin. That is incorrect. It's actually trimethoprim supomethoxazole. Please refer to our slideshows later on. All right. If you want, you can go back to the video recorded for you guys. Now, nobody answered correctly, so it seems to remain the same. Black precipitates from Bea. Bea is bile efficacy test. This hasn't been discussed before. Alright, wonderful, wonderful. So, two people answered correctly, however, they're not in the top three. Alright, last question. Which of the following are products of biosolubility test? Muramic acid plus alanine, para-aminodimethylbenzaminosinimaldehyde, para benzoic acid plus glycine, benzoic acid plus glycerol. I think if you're listening or if you will remember the questions correctly from previous uh, from the previous ones, you will select muramic acid and alanine. All right, wonderful. So who answered that correctly? I don't know. So I think um, Mayra is still in the top three, as it was yesterday. Joanna is in the top three. All right, and this time I think it's Noreen. So congratulations, Noreen. You are in the running for for um, next week's. Uh, you're you're in the running to get the prize from for my birthday uh, birthday event. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Na chamba lang po, sir. Seven out of twelve isn't chamba for me. I think seven out of twelve isn't chamba. If I'm if I'm mathematically correct, it's above fifty percent. Yeah. Well, it's around 60 or 66 percent so that is not chamba for me but yeah whatever anyway i need to take a print screen of this because this is going to so this is going to become sort of record and all right anyway let's continue with our discussion so are, are you all ready for your discussion for our discussion for today because we're going to discuss um Continuation, basically about abiotrophia and enterococcus. So, um, before we move on, though, I want to continue our discussion on um, something that I forgot to discuss earlier because this was additions to my, to my. Uh, these were just a couple of additions to the this, to my discussion. So, hemolysins are oxygen labile type are produced by streptococcus and specific toxic to what cells or tissue? This was an addition. Um, uh, I think 2015 I added this because I was doing another lecture on another class and the organism, the cells that are targeted by hemolysins are blood cells and myocardial, myocardial cells. That's the reason why we also associate scarlet fever with, um, with rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic heart failure. So please don't forget that anything that is associated with bacterial hemolysins specifically SLO or streptolysin O, we want to identify we want to identify the antibodies against SLO. So anti-SLO, hence the term ASO test in serology. Alright? So that's the reason why people are why doctors are requesting these tests because we want to avoid the sequela of um, of antibodies of, of rather the disease of uh, scarlet fever towards different parts of the body. All right. So aside from the liver and aside from the liver, aside from the kidneys, the the heart cells are are attacked by antibodies directed against against um, the M protein uh, the, against AS, against streptolysin O. So please put that into your noggins and let it marinate there because that will be a question in the board exam again. All right. Now inoculation technique. This is the thing that we discussed earlier. Stab and streak. Or what you call vertical stab, as what uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Adrian has told told you guys about. This is just a quick review of some of the things that you got, you have you forgot to discuss earlier. Now, neonatal infections are commonly associated with beta hemolytic strep, specifically specifically Streptococcus agalactiae. 
Streptococcus argalactiae has what again? Has has a lot of hemolysis. All right, wonderful. Now let's talk about group D streptococcus because they're divided into two groups. There's the non-enterotoxic group, a uh, non-enterococcide group, and the other one is the <coughs> the other one or the B group is what we call the enterococcus group. This is just a quick introduction before we move on to. Uh, this is just a quick recap of uh, things that you might have forgotten earlier which may be important to your board exams. An enterococcus group includes the following organisms, Fecalis and Trichium, all right? Those are the things that you need to remember, Fecalis and Trichium. And aside from that, we also have Durans and Atrium, all right? For enterococcus, non-enterococcus group, we have the Streptococcus bovis and Streptococcus equinus, all right? So please don't forget this, because they might ask you, which of the following does not, does not Belong to the enterococcus group. So remember, in the in the question banks for the ASCP exam, they have several questions like this. So I want you guys to please be mindful of these questions. Now let's talk about the tests for group D streptococcus because there's a lot of them. All right, but the most important one that we need to remember is bile estrogen or BEA. Please don't forget your friend BEA because it uses 40% bile and estrogen, hence the term bile estrogen, bile estrogen hydrolysis or bile estrogen test, okay? Beya, B. What is B? What is the A in Beya ba? Bile estrogen agar lang yan, right? All right, so please don't forget it's bile estrogen hydrolysis. We use Beya or the bile estrogen agar to test for bile estrogen hydrolysis. Now, the reaction of the bile is that is as follows it will produce ferric chloride which reacts to esculetin which are the end products of your esculin to form black precipitate now this is your negative control and this the other one is your positive control please don't forget ferric chloride is the end product that is measured that reacts with esculetin to form black precipitate okay now let's move on to the test used to differentiate non-enterococcus from enterococcus species. There's two tests. Again, uh, we need to allow it to grow on 6.5% sodium chloride. Okay, this time it's 6.5% sodium chloride. Please don't forget the 7.5% 7, 7 sodium chloride is for MSA. All right, and then we also have PYR. An enterococcus species will test positive for both. What again are our enterococcus species? There's four, Enterococcus fecalis, Enterococcus fecium, or Streptococcus fecalis, Streptococcus fecium, Streptococcus durans, and Streptococcus avium. Please don't forget those four organisms because they are usually the ones that are going to be a cause of a headache for you when they, when they, ask, it for, when they ask in the board exams. All right? Okay. So right now, they usually, uh, they've uh, because I've created this exam, uh, this particular slideshow on the on the year two thousand in the year two thousand nine. Okay, back then, the terminology for enterococcus and streptococcus is quite vague for you guys. But the conventional terminology that we use right now, even if you use automated machines, is the enterococcus group. All right, so enterococcus is now the term. For these organisms. So if you see Enterococcus fecium, Enterococcus fecalis, these are the same organisms because they've just been reclassified into their own into their own organism, into their own genera or family. Okay? So please don't be confused. All right, Noreen? Okay? Wonderful, Noreen. Thank you. I was reading your mind and I, and I, I believe you're supposed to say yes, sir. You're about to say yes, sir. All right, examples of alpha hemolytic streptococcus is, of course, your what? Streptococcus viridans and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Why are these two important? You will find out later. But you need to remember there are five tests used to differentiate the group. And one of the groups, one of the two, organ one of the two alpha hemolytic organisms will test positive to all. Uh, this is going to be Streptococcus pneumoniae. All of, the, all of them will test, all of the tests that I mentioned will test positive for the following. Animal inoculation, yes, check. 
Optician sensitivity, yes, check. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Bile solubility, check, yes. Bile solubility, please remember, is different from bile esculin, all right? Inulin formula, immunolin fermentation is also another one. That is, again, checked for streptococcus pneumoniae. And the most uh, sensitive one, which is Neufeld key lung test, which is the one that we mentioned earlier in our first in our day one of the discussion in bacteriology, is this one. Neufeld key lung capsular swelling test is also going to test positive for streptococcus pneumoniae. By the way, guys, by the way, guys, what is the positive result? What is the positive, uh, which, what is the reason why streptococcus pneumoniae tests positive for Neufeld key lung test or the capsular swelling test? Can anybody tell me why? Tell me why? Sorry. Wala? Nobody? Nobody can tell me why it will test positive for Neufeld key lung test? We mentioned it in the first day, and I think I mentioned it again yesterday. We're talking about why? What's the reason why Streptococcus pneumoniae will test positive for um, Neufeld key lung? What special component or pathogenic determinant? Anybody? Let's try asking. Joanna, why do you think it's positive? Why do you think it will test positive? Streptococcus pneumoniae. What pathogenic determinant? Kapareha siya ni Haemophilus influenzae at saka ni Cryptococcus neoformans. Oh, I gave you all the clues. Capsule. Yes, I read it from your mind. You are about to say capsule. So I, I took it straight out of your mouth and said it for the whole class to hear. Thank you so much, Joanna. All right. The test used to detect the presence of amidates using Streptococcus. Well, this is your bile Bile, es bile solubility test. Don't confuse bile solubility and bile esculin, all right? Because these are the reactions that you're going to use. Bile, bile solubility uses sodium disoxycholate and a bile salt. With, the re with these reactions, you will produce the end product of muramic acid and alanine. And this is actually uh, characterized by dissolution of the colony. You will dissolve the colony when you add sodium disoxycholate and bile to the colonies. All right? All right. Now, let's move on to taxophene. What is the other name for taxophene? Taxophene, taxophene is your optochin. Okay? Taxo A is basitracin. Taxo B is optochin. Taxo, oi, that I have a mnemonic. Tax op, optochin. Chemical name for this one is very long. Um, I think I don't remember it anymore, but let me try to remember. I'll challenge myself without looking at the next slide. Ethylene hydrocupulene, something like that. Hydrochloride or hydro? So oh yeah, let me let's check. I'll oh, say so, so. I'm still I'm still familiar. All right, ethylene hydrocupulene, hydrochloride. So I didn't get the last one, but fortunately I was able to get the correct first three. So hopefully that will be that will be sufficient. That, that would suffice for you guys. All right, next, this is the test that's most sensitive. That this is the most sensitive serological test. <clears throat> this is the most, uh, that's a typographical error. Used to detect streptococcus pneumoniae. This is Neufeld key lung capsular swelling test. All right, so components of this one is the anti capsular antibodies and methylene blue. What's methylene blue for? It is your background stain, and we want to see a whitish background. So, similar to India ink. That is actually what it looks like. Now, um, other term for nutritionally variant streptococcus. So, again, sir, do we need to know about this? Of course, you need to know about them because they are usually tested in exams. So, one thing that you need to remember is the abiotrophia species. Okay, if you're familiar with them, abiotrophia is an organism. Abiotrophia, uh, abiotrophia is, I think it's relatively new, okay? Uh, but during my, during my, uh, when I was studying, they are known as streptococcus. The no notable species are streptococcus adjuvans, adjuvans and deficium. Okay? Wait, what happened? All right. So, yeah, adjuvant, adjacent rather, and defectivus. And they require cysteine and pyridoxal for the growth. 
basically pyridoxal acid or vitamin B6. Okay, so anything related with vitamin B6, immediately think of the abiotrophy deficiency or abi abiotrophia, abiotrophia adjacent or abiotrophia defectivus. These are most likely the organisms that would require the vitamin B6. All right, so streptococcus species associated with dental caries, MMS. Okay, that's my mnemonic for this one, MMS, mutants, mites, and sanguis. Okay, yes, good, I still remember. Now, let's talk about the organisms that are associated with liver and brain abscess. Sanguinosus, please don't confuse it with sanguis. Okay, um, sanguinosus and intermediate and milleri. All right. Streptococcus milleri is actually a case study in a in the test bank for um for for the uh, what's called this ASCP exam. So please don't forget about them as well. All right. Conditions associated with a streptococcus uh, streptococcus um, sanguinosis, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Okay, I don't think that would, that would be tested because there's a lot of organisms that cause subacute bacterial endocarditis. So we we've, ma we've managed to move from gram positive caucus to gram negative caucus after this uh, uh, within the span of 13 minutes. That is amazing. Okay, and we need to talk about Neisseria species and other gram negative cocci. All right, so the morphological characteristics of Neisseria species is that they are gram-negative, gram-negative kidney E-shaped dipococcus. That's the question for question number, that's the answer for question number one. And what species is the exemption for this one? Well, basically based on, uh, basically from the name itself, you can, you can say that it's not, uh, it's, it's an exemption to the rule. Why? Because Neisseria elongata is another organism that you, we're going to talk about uh, that, uh, that's involved in the morphological ap uh, morphological appearance in the gram state. So gram-negative coffee bean, sh coffee bean kidney bean shaped dipococcus, most, no, that is most probably. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. All right. I think I got disconnected a little bit from my microphone. I need to fix this really, guys. All right. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, aside from morphological characteristic, how is Neisseria elongata differentiated from, different from other species of uh, Neisseria based on the biochemistry? Well, all species of Neisseria are positive for catalase except for Neisseria elongata. Okay? So all of them are positive for catalase. Sir, kailangan ulit magcatalase? Yes. Yes. It's sure. It's me. All right. Hello, hello. Gosh, I really need to. Okay, so you guys can hear me. So guys, um make So I get All right. So guys, do I need to do catalase test again? Of course, you need to do catalase test. So basically, this is the workup. Gram-positive organism. Cocci or bacillus? Cocci. Is it negative or gram-positive? If it's positive, we need to do gram, gram, gram We need to do catalase test. If it's if it's gram negative, do we still need to do gram gram? Uh, do we still need to do catalase? Yes, of course. Why? We want to differentiate it from Ilongata, which is basically a non-pathologic Neisseria species, so that we don't need to work up. We don't need to do an extended workup of the organism. Okay. So yeah. So biochemical characteristics of Neisseria species, aside from Neisseria oligata, will test positive for catalase test, and they will also test positive for oxidase test. Okay, so catalase test, except for Neisseria oligata, please put that in the back of your minds. Let it marinate there. Let it stay there for a while. Let it stay there. All right, and then we have oxidase test as well. Okay, so based on the based on the oxidase result, we could say that what. Neisseria is what an obligate or a uh, obligate or a facultative anaerobe, uh, aerobe rather, obligate or facultative, oxidase positive. Anybody? 
or you can use the chat if you want. If you want to remain, if you want to remain democratic here, because I, it seems that uh, based on my question earlier, everybody supports each other here. So I want everybody to answer: Is the is Nigeria an obligate or a or a facultative anaerobe? Chat box, I'm waiting. Nobody? Nobody will answer. Obligate, okay. Who else? Maybe other members of, maybe other participants will say obligate, obligate as well, alright. What about uh, facultative? Obli, obli. Who else? Anybody? Obligate, obligate. Everybody saying obligate. So yeah, you are all correct. But, please don't forget that in the um, uh, in in the in vitro, this is basically the uh, the test for testing whether or not something is an obligate aerobe. But in vivo, uh, in vitro, which means in the test tube, if you don't, if you guys don't know, is that um, these organisms are fastidious organisms and they require capno and they require a capnophilic environment. What do I say when I when an organism requires a capnophilic environment? They require CO2. And the specific concentration is again five to ten percent CO2. Actually, guys, when I was in the Philippines, we're using, were you, we were using um, a candle jar. Are you familiar with the candle jar? Everybody is everybody is everybody familiar with a candle jar? Okay, okay, Charis, because you're familiar with a candle jar, how do we use a candle jar to basically um, provide? Um, CO2 en enriched environment for your inoculum. Wonderful! Oh my gosh, wonderful! That was so wonderful because we that we because fire relies on oxygen. It means that once the candle jar is closed, it will consume the remaining CO2, the remaining oxygen molecules. Correct. Is that correct, Charisse? So without the presence of oxygen, the only thing the only thing that will remain from this reaction is CO2. And therefore, that is enough to grow your fastidious organisms, specifically CO capnophilic organisms. All right? So that's a wonderful explanation. But in my, uh, in my experience here when I worked abroad, they don't use it anymore because some of the... Some of the organisms, especially the members of the Hasek group, they require a, they require a lot of uh, um, they require a steady supply of CO2, specifically at this percentage. All right, so they have incubators that are connected to a CO2 gas tank. All right, I wish I could have taken a picture of that one, but unfortunately we don't have that one also in our previous hospital in in our in my current hospital because it doesn't have a specialized uh, microbiology section. But yeah. In my previous work here in Saudi Arabia, we have a specialized incubator for CO2 production, and it's actually part of the uh, part of the accreditation that we provide these particular incubators. Why? Because we are we are we added it to our services that we're doing. We are doing routine, routine, uh, routine culture and sensitivity and part of the part of the tests and the primary inoculum requires me to put an in, uh, you know an initial comp uh, an, an initial uh, in, an initial what do you call this an initial inoculum of three uh, three things of three uh, culture medias that's blood agar plates okay and then another one is chocolate agar and um, the third one is makoki both of the both both blood agar and makonki are incubated at aerobic conditions, while chocolate agar is incubated at CO2 or the CO2 incubator. All right. So yeah, that's a little bit tidbit. That's a little tidbit for you guys. Um, next, what is the most important pathologic determinant of Neisseria species? It's actually the fimbriae or the pili. Okay, because it allows the adherence of the organism to the host cells. 
All right, so what test is used for the, the presumptive diagnosis of Neisseria gonorrhea? Please don't forget this because if you buy some of the books, you will see this all of the time. You will see this all of the, if you see this all of the time in the books, especially at the back pages where there are question banks, you will see this all of the time because the test that is used for the presumptive diagnosis of Neisseria gonorrhea is not actually gram stain, but rather it's superoxol test. Contrary to popular belief, it's not gram, it, it's not gram stain. It's superoxol test. And the reagent that we use is, again, hydrogen peroxide, but the percentage is quite different. It's 30% hydrogen peroxide. All right? Okay? Clear? Okay, we still have five minutes in, the, in our discussion. We can move on. All right. What tests may be used to confirm the identification of Nicaea gonorrhea? Well, there are two things that you need to do. You have to culture it, prove it in the gram stain that it's actually it's actually Neisseria gonorrhea. From the gram stain, you have to culture it, and then you have to do fermentation tests. And the fermentation tests that we need to do is for glucose. Okay, glucose. So don't forget glucose gonorrhea. Oh, diba? Easy peasy. All right. So gonorrhea leads to what forms of infections? For males, it's actually purulent urethritis. So in Tagalog, in our in Tagalog vernacular, we talk about we, we call this tulo. All right. So familiar case of tulo, I, I suppose. Some of you guys have already worked in the hospital, I think. So yeah, from what I've heard from your uh, previous conversation later earlier. Okay. Chismosa ako musang habang nagluluto, no? All right. Next, for females, it's actually cervicitis. Okay. And now. Which gender, now we were talking about which sex rather, not gender, because gender is the um, is a, an umbrella term. I didn't know when I was a kid, when I was still a kid when I prepared this. So it's supposed to be which sex would would a gram stain of, Neisseria, of a presumptive Neisseria gonorrhea be sensitive on? Is it on the male side or on the female side? Give me an answer, everybody, anybody. Female, all right. Okay, anybody can contest her? Anybody on the chat? Adrian, Noreen, Cesar, female din, kay Charisse, okay. Kay Joanna, female, all right. Kay Adrian, female also, all right, okay. What about Rainiel? I haven't seen you type in the chat. What about Cesar? I want to see how uh, everybody thinks here. Because this is an important question. Because this was asked in the board exams of, I think, my friend from 2000, uh, 2013 or 2012. Because she got, she, got, she got held back. But I remember she told me, Friend, pumasa ako, friend. Sabi niya, friend, pumasa ako dahil naalala ko yung tinanong mo sa akin nung tinututor mo ko. So ang sagot niya, este babae, I mean. Type of post, sir. All right. Okay, so everybody said babae. Everybody said babae or girls or females or whatever. But actually, contrary to popular belief, again, it is actually the males. All right? Vaginal swabs are mostly done to diagnose certain other disorders such as um, non non uh, what do you call this? Non-beta hemolytic strep. A non 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 what do you call this non group a beta hemolytic strep non uh, na, uh, pathologic candidiasis trichomonas vaginalis and other other th other microorganisms that doesn't involve uh, that doesn't involve Neisseria gonorrhea that's basically the importance of this the of vaginal swabs contrary to popular belief it is actually the penile discharge that will most likely give you the highest yield of organisms in the gram stain and in the culture media. Yes, when I was working in the Philippines, it is actually the penile discharge. And I've proven this even in actual practice. And I've proven this even in actual practice that penile discharge actually allows the growth of uh, of Neisseria gonorrhea better than that of vaginal swabs. So please don't forget about that one. All right? 
Okay, so I think that's the end of our lecture. Um, would it be okay if I extend a little bit more, like um, 20 minutes? Would it be okay for you guys? All right, so everybody said yes. Um, Mr. Marco, I assume you're not doing anything else with your life right now? <laughs> <laughs> you're not doing a little bit anything else about your life right now so it's okay for every so everybody is in consensus so we'll end at uh 12 20 here uh i don't know what time it is there in the philippines i think 5 20 we'll end at 5 20 there in the philippines but yeah okay so eye infections in newborns are affected uh in newborns from mother mothers infected with nicaea gonorrhea what is this it's ophthalmia neonatorum the way to prevent this is Creed's prophylaxis. All right, Creed's prophylaxis. And traditionally, it uses one percent silver nitrate. Um, and I assume it's already uh it's already been discussed earlier in our previous lectures. So I don't need to uh I don't need to linger on towards this particular um discussion anymore. All right. So now let's talk about Neisseria meningitidis or the meningococcus or meningococcemia because it's pretty common i think there was a case there when i was still working in the philippines um somewhere in albay or aklan i'm not sure but it's a city there in aklan that had an outbreak of meningi meningitis but only one person died but it was it was sort of like a scare in in the community so how is it transmitted so it's transmitted via inhalation and close contact with people. That's why it's such a dangerous organism to work with, all right? It's a dangerous organism to work with. And that is the reason why we always assume CSF samples to, we also include, that's the reason why we always put standard precaution on every sample because inhalation of droplets, anything associated with close contact, especially for these types of organism, we need to be, mi we need to be mindful that of the transmission, all right? So meningococcus is actually very infectious. Okay? It's infectious. It's it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy right now. You might not get it. It's not like that. It's not like COVID, guys. You might be able to get it because you have close contact with a patient or with a patient with this one. And actually, I think if I'm not mistaken, there in the Philippines, you need to be isolated from the community. As what they did in either Aklan or Albay. I'm not really not sure which one, but I remember it was an A. It started with an A. The city started with an A. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong with this. But anyway, let's start with let's talk about meningitis. Infections that are common in what age group? It's common in children. Okay, actually, it's major. It's dangerous in children primarily because the adult hosts are much more. Uh, they usually can fend off the meningi menin the meningococcus but children they don't have enough defense for this organism so it's actually the adults that are the carriers okay so let's move on to um the pathognomonic appearance of a meningococcus or meningococcemia um fever associated with um cns disorders with what you call scattered ptka all right, scattered PTK. Here in the Middle East, what they do is if a person has um, signs and symptoms of a CNS disturbance with a fever, they automatically would assume that the patient has meningococcemia and they would put him under isolation. They would then check for the patient if the patient has PTK. What is the reason? Because this is an organism that causes um, thrombocytopenia. You'll find out later. Hemorrhagic bleeding. Okay? So hemorrhagic bleeding of the adrenal glands is associated with what meaning with what with what meaning cocal um infection. This is actually what you call the Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. Okay? So what is Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome? I'll just give you guys a quick overview. Um Waterhouse Friedrichsen, CNS symptoms associated with associated with fever plus the PTKA. That I'm talking about, and then um, bleeding in bleeding in the internal organs, specifically with the adrenal glands, is going to be is going to point out to Waterhouse-Friedrichsen syndrome. Okay. Now 
let's move on to the biotypes of meningitis. We have A, B, C, Y, and W, which are the ones that mainly causes meningococcemia. There are five of them. Please don't forget about them. And the specimens that are useful for the diagnosis of meningococcus is, of course, CSF, the best one that we can, the best one that we can use because there's rapid diagnosis. We can do, uh, we can do rapid diagnosis in the CSF, either through culture and sensitivity. Okay, and because of the high fatality rate, the best way to the best way to detect meningococcus is through serologic typing, the fastest way. So the patient can start the, the patient can start treatment immediately. Blood can also be used, but on the top of the list, CSF is important. Nasopharyngeal swab is used for swabbing the community for faster uh, faster recovery of the uh, for faster biostatistics especially if, if it became endemic in a particular uh, in a particular place because of the outbreaks all right so now we need to talk about um, uh, culture media because in our discussion of culture medias we barely we barely touched on the culture media for Nicaea species and there are actually four uh, I've updated it I've updated it um, two days ago three days ago so hopefully these are the st these are still the same. You have Thayer Martin. And the only difference between them, all of them are basically chocolate agars with different concentration, different antibiotics. Okay, Thayer Martin has vancomycin, cholestin, nystatin. Okay, modified Thayer Martin has an addition, has the addition of trimethoprim. The only the different two will be Martin Lewis and New York City agar. They have um, they have vancomycin. Cholestine, trimetoprim, as the first three important ones, okay, and anisomycin for Martin Lewis, amphotericin for New York City agar, all right. So those are the or the these are the um, culture media that you need to remember, okay. NYC is uh, added uh, as a recent addition to that one. Okay, so now let's differentiate the following uh, organisms based on sugar fermentation test. You need to have um, you need to have a great uh, understanding of the of mnemonics. Again, sabi nga nila sa amin sa review center. I think it's in Axe Review Center if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sir Marco. If uh, what they say is correct, the ignang wa is ang ang matalino. All right, so this is one of the ways I remember this. Uh, I uh, I answer this. Is that the correct uh, one, Sir Marco? The ignang why is matalino. I think it's Analea Navarro. I'm coining Analea Navarro, huh? Yeah, but I think that's the way she told it. Uh, the ignang why is ang matalino. Okay, so paano tayo magiging yes, yes. Thank you, Sir Marco, for the comments. But yeah, paano natin ma paano natin Back? Am I here? You guys hear me? Hello, 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 hello. Testing, testing. All right. So where are we now? So how pano tayo magiging matalino di? How pano tayo magiging wise di to sa ano? To? Please don't forget GML, GML. Write it on. Write it like this. GML, glucose, maltose, lactose. Write it this way again. For gono, meningo, lactamica. GML. Then make a period, make a step. Just make a step like this, and that is basically your uh, shortcut for understanding the uh, the sugar fermentation reaction of the following organisms. See, you don't need to think that much. All you need to do, uh, all you need to remember, is these things. All right. So I don't want you guys to I don't want you guys to stress out with the biochemical testing because. In our next lecture for uh, Enterobacteria C family, that will be the most difficult one, I think, in terms of biochemistry. So I want you guys to chillax when it comes to the sugar fermentation tests of these organisms. All right. So the ignang wa is ang matalino in in our Filipino uh, vernacular. All right. Now let's move on to the confirmatory test of the identification of Nicaea gonorrhea and uh, Nicaea lactamica. 
So in order for us to confirm the presence of Neisseria lactamica, we need to we need to test it with ONPG. ONPG. All right, so we need to test it with ONPG. And based on the media, um, how can we different? Um, based on media, maybe be, what base media may be used in testing the sugars for um, for Neisseria species? So we have uh, two or two base media. When I say base media, this hasn't been added with any type of with any type of um, antibiotics, enhancements, or inhibiting factors. So when we want to test for sugars, you just get a couple of inoculum, uh, of spe uh, inoculum okay, uh, a loop full of your inoculum, and then put it on this broth, on peptone broth or or cyst 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 cystine triptychase with with the following sugars. Glucose, maltose, and lactose. All right. If the organism is able to do, if if the organism is able to ferment this, ferment it, it will produce a color indicator. It will produce a change in the color, provided you use also a, a color indicator. All right. Now let's move. Let's move on with the most common culture media used for the identification of Neisseria species. It's basically an enrichment media. So the one that we're using is what. What is the most com what most culture media uses the identification basically what enrichment media? It is what? Blood agar, chocolate agar, or makonki. What did I mention earlier? Who 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 was that? Was it Joanna or um Charis? Alright, Joanna. Hindi ka kasi nagpakilala. Di ba sabi ko siya, magpakilala ka muna. Ikaw talaga, Joanna. <laughs> Charing. Charing lang. Alright? Alright? So, what do we, what antibio, uh, aside from antibiotics, um, as I, that I mentioned before, we have NYC Agar, Thayer Martin, what define Thayer Martin, and then the other one is Martin Lewis. Aside from this one, we add an extra special, uh, an extra special nutrient, which is basically isovitalex and hemoglobin all right isovitalex and hemoglobin so all of those uh, things that i've discussed earlier let's go back these four are basically chocolate media as i mentioned before they are chocolate media with different with varying um types of antibiotics aside from that they are enriched with hemoglobin and isovitalex or isovitalex now uh, genital mycoplasma may also be cultivated with uh, NYC medium, just a recall, just a recap. If we may not be able to go with nice na, with if we don't if we don't get to the point of discussing mycoplasmas. So NYC media is actually the organism uh, is actually the culture media that we will use for um, nice uh, mycoplasma. Okay, now let's talk about the Neisseria species. Uh, different Neisseria species that have the same characteristics as Neisseria meningitidis. It's actually Neisseria subflaba. Okay? Subflaba. Alright? And uh, this is differentiated in what specific growth requirement. It grows at room temperature. Okay? Because Neisseria subflaba is actually a enviro is an environmental contaminant. Alright? So please be careful. That's the reason why we always do it we always do inoculation of our specimens in a biosafety cabinet that is clean and that is always the protocols in every laboratory. So please, if you're working in the laboratory, specifically in the microbiology lab, in the microbiology laboratory, please clean up after your work. Okay? Because because we want to avoid these uh, these types of contaminants. All right. Now, which gram-negative organisms also grows in sheep blood agar but are less fastidious 5% sheep agar to be much more, to be much more specific Neisseria meningitidis saprophytic Neisseria and Muraxiella all right but the most fastidious actually from the Neisseria species is actually your Neisseria gonorrhea now sir kakasabi mo lang kanina kailangan ko ng chocolate agar kay Neisseria meningitidis yes it's true actually in in most uh, laboratory protocols that I've been wor I've worked with several hospitals now, uh, Neisseria meningitidis is said to grow on blood agar plates. But the test that we use in order for us to avoid uh, in order for us to avoid 
cross-contamination of organisms, we test the organisms that grow in Thayer Martin and chocolate agar medium. And uh, again, that doesn't mean it's it, it that doesn't mean it's difficult to grow this organism. It just so happens that they are less fastidious than Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, since we're talking about uh since we're talking about Neisseria uh, uh gram negative organisms that grow in in sheep blood agar plates that are aside aside from uh Neisseria species, we have to talk about uh Moraxella species. Okay? Moraxella species. And one of them is Moraxella catarhalis, all right? And Moraxella catarhalis is a DNA-positive organism that ferments no, sh uh, that is a non-sugar fermenter. Okay, so this is an organism that is a non-sugar fermenter. So all of the tests here might confuse you for Moraxella catarhalis, but there is one thing that will differentiate it, it, it and it's DNA tests and Sugar fermentation. Sir, DNA is test na naman. Yes. Paulit ulit tayo sa DNAs, di ba? Only the sugar fermentation will make it will differentiate it from Neisseria species because it is not a sugar fermenter. All right. Okay. So now all medic all medically gram negative cocci are aerobic except for these two organisms. Except for these two organisms. You have Villonella parvula and uh, Villonella species and Moraxella cataralis. All right. Now, what sugars are fermented by Villonella species? It's lactose. All right. But how do we differentiate it from uh, from Neisseria? We can di differentiate it specifically Villonella parvula because they can cause different types of diseases, osteomyelitis and endocarditis. And I think that's the end of our slideshow. I forgot to add one more thing. Red fluorescence of Villonella parvula. Villonella parvula will produce reddish fluorescence when stained with um, acridine orange. All right? So that is the end of our discussion. And hopefully, you guys will be prepared for next week because next week is probably the most difficult week for microbiology. All right? So with that, I hope you guys I hope you guys have a nice week ahead of you and uh, tomorrow is Sunday please don't forget to pray because I've heard so much from our little talk from your little talk with Mr. Marco that a lot of you are a lot of you require um require the require to pass this class it it is one of the most difficult subjects in medical technology and I hope you guys pass really in in every subject i think in every subject that i have encountered it is the most difficult one and it requires because it requires memory work as well as in the detailed analysis of the questions that you might encounter in the exams so please be mindful of all the things that i provided for you if you are an auditory learner Go back to that. Go back to the playlist that I provided for you. If you are someone who likes to write stuff, then go back and then answer the flashcards right, and try to challenge yourself. So it requires dedication on your side as well. Okay. So with that in mind, I hope you guys have a nice day and see you guys next week. Bye. And again. And again, thank you, Sir Marco, for inviting me. Hopefully next week we have the same we I don't have the I don't have to cook for myself. But yeah. Bye guys.